Um, so I'm delighted to see um, so many people here. What am I going to be talking about? I'm basically going to be talking about performance variants in Liszt piano music, but I have a more general point, which is really the point of how do we transmit a musical text? In other words, what is music and what are possibly the problems of our present day editions? Um, this is particularly <sighs> problematic with Liszt simply because Liszt did not write, compose and revise according to the tenets of modern day urtext editions. Um, this is really the problem here and I, I want in the next 40 minutes to try and explain what some of the issues are um, and how one might overcome them. Um, and basically what I will conclude in, in case any of you are in unbearable suspense is that for composers like this we effectively need a hypertext. Um, in other words, a, a text that goes beyond the, the normal tenets of what constitutes a transmittable text. Um, and indeed, it, we probably need to consider classical music in a very wide sense in this, in this way to be best transmitted in the way that our so-called ethnomusicological music is transmitted, i.e. as music, as sound. Um, but let me start by outlining the problem. Um, the problem really is that, as you probably know, if you know anything about Liszt and many of, of the other 19th century pianist composers, they didn't tend to just write a work, have it printed, and then forget about it. Um, with Liszt, the, the um, issues are quite manifold, quite astonishing. He would regularly write four versions of something, maybe three of which would be published throughout, he, throughout the years. And then there might be variants of these separate versions. And then you might find that in his last years, he went back to the first version and varied that. Sometimes he appears to have even forgotten he did a revision, uh, especially if he did it some, in some other country and then would revise the earlier version in a completely different way, se seemingly without any recollection that he'd already revised the earlier version. So I could go on like this in many, many ways. The source problems, in other words, in terms of normal sources are, are very great indeed. Um, now there's a, a third level of sort of pro problems with this, shall we say, and that is Liszt students. Um, from about 1850 onwards, Liszt taught many piano pupils. Um, you will read in most of the volumes about Liszt that Liszt taught in the master class. Liszt invented the master class, you, you, would, you would hear. In other words, in Weimar, Rome, and Budapest, he had a bunch of students around here. Um, like some people here today, uh, so some of the students would perform and he would criticize them. Or more often in Weimar, he had a little, he lived, he lived next to, next to in Weimar. If you go to the Hofgärtnerei in Weimar, his little bedroom was right next to where he taught the master classes. There was a Bechstein grand piano in the window. He had a little upright that he played on. And there were two doors, both of them leading to his bedroom, this tiny bedroom in circular. And when the students were playing very badly, he would shuffle through one of the doors they were still playing and come back 30 seconds later smelling very strongly of cognac. <laughs> so, so he would basically go in for a drink in, in between and then sort of shuffle back. So, so it was rather a sort of collegial family environment. So we will read it sort of lists, so invented the master class and taught in master classes. All perfectly true. But what you don't read about um, is the fact that this really was only the situation for the commoner garden students. Um, for the better students, they came and had normal piano lessons, um, sometimes before the master classes, sometimes after the master classes. Most of the time in Weimar, for example, they were invited to come in the morning. Um, the really great pianists, the people who are going to be the, the best performers of the next generation, Arthur Friedheim, Emil von Sauer, Alexander Salotti, Moritz Rosenthal, all had private lessons. And in those private lessons, Liszt listened not only to the pieces in their general repertoire, but all the music of his own um, that they were playing. Um, and as he did so, he would annotate their copies. Um, sometimes with performance advice, um, but quite often with variants of the score. Um, sometimes these variants were relatively minor, sort of do it like this, it's easier. Uh, as, as he sometimes said, when I wrote this initially, I didn't teach so much and I now realize it's almost impossible, so play, play it differently. Um, other times we would actually recompose 
certain passages. Um, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because even the more extensive of these variants have mostly not appeared in modern editions, especially the new list edition, um, which has a very, very draconian um, view to the transmission of text. Basically, like many modern urtext editions, anything that wasn't actually printed um, or in some respect is in the hand of the composer uh, will not make it into the edition. So supposing Liszt said, no, play this instead, and the student wrote it down, um, it won't appear in, in any modern edition. Um, even the annotations he d d did actually write in his own hand, more, more or less, most of them I'd say about 80% don't appear in modern editions. Okay, So we have a sort of source problem to start with that even things in the composer's hand are not normally taken into account. Um, there's a second stage of alteration, um, and that is alterations that he passed down to his pupils in some means as yet un unascertained, all very mysterious. Um, but I'm going to try to tell you later on in this little talk that I think we can very easily ascertain how this, how this is, how this works. And in fact, the non-ascertained things can easily be ascertained. So bear this in mind. But let's go back again and just start about the, the normal process of variant and re variance and rewritings. Um, you have to remember in this that as many of his pupils said in later life, Liszt very rarely played his own music according to the score. Uh, especially in the 1880s when he was an old man, he died in 1886, he would most often produce a fantasy on whatever particular piano piece. This was partly because he just couldn't resist changing things. It was also partly, I'm pretty sure, because he began to forget what he'd actually written. Um, if you see the number of things that Liszt was asked to play, it's almost important. He wrote literally thousands of pieces of music if you take the variants into account, it's almost impossible that he could remember exactly what he wrote. So he'd remember the tune and the main bits and you would get a sort of variant fantasy, as after Friedheim said, a, sort of fa a fantasy on, on, on the piano music with roughly the right tunes and things like that. Sometimes these fantasies could then eventually be transformed into a separate edition of the piece. Um, now, wh what are we talking about here in, de in detail? Let, let me just give you some examples. Supposing we take a very simple sort of arrangement, like um, the, the arrangements of, of Schubert Waltzes called Soiree de Vienne, um, even, Evenings in Vienna. We can build up here how a, a, one of these pieces goes through variants. Okay? Um, for a start, it's published in the 1850s in a version that everybody plays, especially number six. And, and number six goes like this in the 1850s version. This is, this is the version of number six that is almost always played nowadays. If you listen to the Horowitz recording, this is what he plays. And here's the second big waltz theme. Okay, so it carries on like this. Now, we have this sort of middle section. And in the first version, keeps going and then goes. Okay, so we go directly. which is, is, basically, is basically what Schubert wrote. Um, we, Liszt then said to a pupil, I got very bored playing it like this because I played it too much. So I began to change it. Um, we don't really know how he changed in the middle yet, except we, we have a manuscript in the Library of Congress, again unpublished, um, from 1869, dated Rome 1869, demonstrating exactly the process I was describing. It's written for a pupil, Sophie Mentor, um, one, of, one of the very best 19th century woman pianists. According to Liszt, massively better than Clara Schumann, but you're not allowed to say that because Clara Schumann is the Pope, said Liszt, you know, basically. <laughs> and so he thought Sophie Mentor, who, who lived um, into, into not so much the recording era, but to the piano roll era. So there's, there's a variance of this piece and several others for Sophie mentor um, and in, in the Library of Congress and, and we go back to the, our little bit here and instead of going we go in the mentor version and he, he writes it down in the manuscript And 
add something even more. He puts a little asterisk of this funny card and, and says at the side, this card is by Hans von Bülow. Um, just the card, because it was the idea of one of his other pupils, Hans von Bülow, to, instead of just to carry on. But Bülow thought it was a. Yeah. Um, so this is the, uh, after Hans von Bülow. There are many other variants. I'm just using that. So, so this remains unpublished, OK? Um, but Liszt is obviously playing a version using this sort of variant. Um, over the next, next decade or so. And then finally, a uh, revised version is published in 1883, um, which uses the Bülow card and other variants. And it's now expanded a bit further. So we have. Um, I'm just uh, there's many other examples of this. Okay, and finally, another cadenza is added just before that in the 1883 version. Again, based on the same harmony. You can see how it's all being built up, if you like, in a sort of improvisatory way. Because the, the 1850 version, before we led into the boom boom, that was the lead. It. Before we led in in 1853, we got this. Um, in 1883, we have the same harmony, but we stick on the dominant chord, and we have a, we have a little cadenza. And then instead of going right in, we go, we stay in the dominant and go. So you can gradually see that they now I, this is a fairly simple example. Now remember, one of the, the intermediate stage here is completely unpublished. Okay, and were it not for the manuscript um, in the Library of Congress, we wouldn't know that 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 whole little extra harmonic sequence there is based on as this we would a chord by Hans von Bülow, and then he, as he added and some other chords of my own, as he put it, just in case you thought it was all by Hans von Bülow. Okay, so th this is part of the, part of the problem. The, the missing the, the stage the middle stages of these things are sometimes not published and sometimes not actually known. But at least in this example, we have a whole source series that we can document in the way an Urtext edition, where Urtext bothered to document these things. And in case of lists, most of them, them aren't. They just print the last version most of the time. We would be able to document it um, on an, in a normal source basis. Now, um, let's take another example, which is going to be more complicated, which is going to show the same issues, but will not show the same source evidence. But nevertheless, I would argue we can build up from a series of fairly well-grounded inferences how the source situation actually works. And I would argue that, that the situation that I'm going to present now is actually really effectively as, as solidly proven as the first one, except it just doesn't have the right sort of sources for Urtext edition. Uh, I'm going to take another transcription in this time, because see, th this one, again, one that was very often played um, called My Joys, um, based on Chopin. It's the first, the first page of it. Um, is the first one in your exam. If some of you have a sort of have examples, you don't need the examples because I will play what the examples are. I, I'm stunned that there's so many people here. I only printed um, tw 20 of these, and e even then I thought it was going to be too much. But so I, I shouldn't doubt myself so much, ladies and gentlemen. I should have printed more. Um, anyhow, the, this is my joys from, from the only edition actually published in List Lifetime, and it's basically what the new List edition publishes. Well, there are annotations on it that um, I've made. Um, and I've made the annotations basically from a piano roll by one of Liszt's last pupils, Bernhard Stavenhagen. Um, Stavenhagen is not very well known nowadays, but he was at the time. He died relatively young in 1914. Um, but he was one of Liszt's most famous last pupils. And in fact, Bernhard Stavenhagen, along with Frederick Lamont, um, who was Scottish and who went to my school in Glasgow, I'd like to point out. Um, um, Frederick Lamont and Bernhard both accompanied Liszt on his last trip 
to London in 1886, so they really were among the very last pupils. And Stavenhagen um, was, was with Liszt's entourage when Liszt died in Bayreuth um, a few months later. Um, so Stavenhagen is one of the last pupils, and Stavenhagen, um, along with another pupil of Liszt called Alfred Reisenauer, um, published, or rather I should say issued in 1905, long after Liszt's death, a set of very interesting piano rolls. <coughs> now, these piano rolls were different from even their other Liszt piano rolls. They published many piano rolls of, of Liszt music, but these ones um, had the subscription, this very slightly from roll to roll, Nach persönlichen Erinnerungen an Franz Liszt. Um, after personal recollections of Liszt. Um, f five, five or six rolls altogether. Uh, very unusual. No other piano rolls of Liszt pupils have these, subscrip uh, these subscriptions on them. There were uh, American versions of the rolls, um, and these American versions of the rolls, this was translated as, as played by Liszt. Uh, which is not quite the same thing as you, as you will know after personal recollections of her as played by Liszt. But I would argue that in fact it's probably, sub probably substantially right. One of these roles um, is Meine Freuden, My Joys, here. Um, what Stavenhagen plays is very different indeed from what is printed there. Um, it's very different not just in what he eventually plays, um, but even, even the way he plays it, if I, I, I'm going to play a bit of the Stavenhagen roll in a transfer I don't particularly like, but uh, you, you notice the, the opening here. Uh, Stavenhagen adds this. Now notice it says here, writ. So writ and smart sand, and Stavenhagen does the absolute opposite. Instead of going, Stavenhagen goes <laughs> like that, totally the opposite. Stavenhagen adds the octave and the run up. And then he just sort of slithers down on a single chromatic scale instead of what you've got there. He said, I haven't printed, printed it over there. So this is just give you an idea of the, of the sort of, shall we say, performance differences now. However, the end of the piece in the, in the way it's published and printed nowadays and in the, in the only edition of Liszt's lifetime, it ends like this, G flat major chord arpeggio. Okay, um, here's the end of Stavenhagen's role and this is how I got, got rather sort of in, interested in this because as soon as I heard that I was, um, well, I may so th think, think G flat major and think a simple arpeggio. Um, and we'll, we'll press this, if I can actually press the correct button. <laughs> you, got the G, you got the G flat arpeggio, did you hear that? But now he's trilling um, on G flat, and it's going to turn into N harmonic F sharp. Sorry if there are no musicians here, it doesn't matter, it's the same note. Um, you know, at least it is on the piano. Sorry, Robin. It is as far as I'm concerned. Okay, <laughs> is that a thing? It isn't on the strings, or indeed if you're a good singer, which I'm not. So, so it's the same note. Okay. None of this is published on this lifetime, and it keeps going. It's sort of, you know, really, really, really absolutely lovely stuff. Um, the first time I heard it, I thought to my, now, 
This is very different, notice, from the sort of reinforcements or changing in octaves or adding a bit of figure. This is very different from the sort of thing that I was talking about at the beginning, where instead of going, you, you go up the octave. And instead of going, you just go. Um, I mean, because these are, are basically performance variants that everybody did at the time. This, what we have here, is an entire uh, additional page of coda um, that wasn't published in this lifetime um, and isn't actually published in any modern ed edition that, that I know of. It's, it, the new list edition isn't aware of this. Now, were the new list edition aware of this, it still wouldn't publish it. Why would it still not publish it? Because the only actual evidence of linking this directly with Liszt is this piano roll, um, written as a, 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 subscribed as according to personal recollections of Liszt. Yet, if you know anything about Liszt style, it's pretty obvious that that wasn't composed by Stavenhagen. Very, very obvious indeed. Um, as it happens, Moritz Rosenthal, another Liszt pupil, also has an, a different extra unpublished coda for this piece, partly based on the same, the same sort of harmony. If, if I play what I'm stubborn. <laughs> That's Stavenhagen. With Rosenthal, we basically, we basically alternate between these chords. So he goes, he, he goes. The chord you have in the middle of the Stavenhagen, and then, then there. So we have an, another variant, a shorter one this time. In Rosenthal's two recordings of this piece, and the variant is slightly different um, each time. So, where does Stavin get this from? Stavin having get this from? Um, and did he just listen to Liszt? Is he making it up? Most people who have listened to these roles have assumed that Stavenhagen is basically lying. Um, relatively few people know, know this material, um, but it was published in a not very good transfer in 1989 and reviewed in the gramophone by Lionel Salter. Um, not just Stavenhagen rolls, but ro piano rolls by Ferruccio Bisoni, Eugen Dalbert. In other words, almost every great pianist from around the 1900s or so. And Lionel Salter hated every one of them. Um, he said Bisoni was careless, he said. Paderewski was incompetent, and Eugen Dalbert was truly terrible. Um, so th this is, an, an, and with Stavenhagen, he came to the according to personal recollections of Liszt, um, and he, sa he said, um, we can only hope, he said, that Stavenhagen's memory must have been dulled in, twen in the 20 years since Liszt's death, because these were the, the roles were recorded in 1905, Liszt died in 1886, because it is impossible to believe that Liszt pa played travesties of his pieces like this, with irregular rhythms on top of it. So it's what he called a regular rhythm. Now, Sal Salter it represents, shall we say, the post, the, the extreme of the post-war consensus, where you only, you only write down anything anything that happens to be documented, and you play it strictly according to what you think the score is actually telling you. So, so this is why, why we're getting this sort of reaction. And since then, this material has been largely ignored, both, both the Stavenhagen roles and the Reisenauer roles. However, um, I was relatively convinced that this must come from lists, so I started doing some sort of investigating and discovered very, very oddly an almost totally unknown edition of this piece, which is over the next page. So, so th this now this is the last. This is an edition. It exists, as far as I'm aware, in only two copies in the world: one in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, and the other in the Isidore Philippe Ar Archive um, in Lafayette in America. Um, now, it is, of course, edited by Isidore Philippe, who was a very famous piano teacher later 19th, early 20th century. Um, it can, it, there's nothing on the, on the title page of the score to indicate that it's at all unusual. It's in French, instead of minor front, it's mes joies. But the same thing, my, my joys, by list, edited by Isidore Philippe. But look at the alternative version of the coda. In other words, and this is published 1917, I say in a very, very small print run, um, but ex more or less exactly what Stavenhagen plays, um, including this nice thing right at the...
which is really lovely. And when I heard that that was the bit, I thought this must be by Liz. This isn't just a penis going. Um, no, this, 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 you know, has been actually properly composed. Um, so I started working. Well, what, how, how does one connect this? Well, now bear in mind um, that Stavenhagen dies very prematurely in, uh, around Christmas time, 1914. Um, we can account for the rarity of this edition and the fact that nobody really knows very much about it by the fact that 1917 wasn't a good year to be publishing editions by, uh, of list pieces in Paris. The Parisians had other things to worry about in 1917, as you can possibly imagine. So th this edition was obviously published in a very small print run and then just disappeared. But where on earth um, did Philippe get, get this from? Now, it's, you, you could argue that it, it was a transcription of the end of Stavenhagen's piano roll, um, but this seems unlikely, partly because Sh Philippe does not reproduce all of Stavenhagen's performance variants, but he does reproduce the coda. Um, the key to this actually came when I, I, re I found a manuscript in a private library in Paris, um, the, the Mediathèque Musicale Mahler, that has been set up by Henri Louis de la Grange, the Mahler guy. Um, now, he, there is a collection there of just assorted manuscripts, and one of them is, um, is, a, is in a letter from Isidore Philippe to some, some sort of pointless aristocrat that I won't go, won't go on about. And in this letter from Isidore Philippe, as a memento, he encloses a page of a manuscript by Liszt. Um, the manuscript is of the My Joyce transcription, but it's an otherwise completely unknown manuscript. Um, it, it doesn't include the coda, but it does include one or two of the, of the extra things that Stavenhagen does. Um, including the, his sort of till ready at the, at the opening. It's printed as. Uh, but as is so often documented with Liszt, there was a, you just repeat the bass until you sort of feel like bringing the tune. Until you feel like bringing the tune in. So this is in this manuscript. Stravenhagen plays that. We don't have exactly the page of the coda, um, but I, I'm speculating in what I think is a reasonable way that one we know then that a, an, another I manuscript I indicating revisions to this piece must at one time have existed completely. We know that at least one page of it was in the possession of Isidore Philippe. And it seems to me not an unreasonable assumption to make to say that the other pages that he didn't bother to send to the Countess were possibly also in his possession, um, and that therefore he had access to a manuscript. Um, and this manuscript indicated that coda, which is otherwise completely in the style of Liszt. Uh, it seems to me a reasonable inference then to say that that is you know, the nearest we're going to get to a normal stem of sources for this, unless we're actually willing to take the piano roll recording um, as, as a proper source. Now, I would argue we should simply take the piano roll recording as a proper source, um, because even were I to present this to the new list edition, they still wouldn't print it, even though it's obviously by list, because there is nothing in the composer's hand um, or, or no printing supervised by the composer, because remember this is 1917, and Liszt di dies in, 19, in 1886, to indicate that this comes from the composer. Um, so th this is, this is you know, one of the issues that I'm trying to illustrate as, a, as a basically a source problem. We, ha we have, I think, fairly obvious but speculative evidence that this comes from Liszt. We have internal evidence that this comes from Liszt, but yet it doesn't appear in any modern Liszt editions because it doesn't conform to the idea of, of, of the Urtex source. Um, so this is the intermediate stage. We have some sort of linking with Liszt, uh, but, no but nothing entirely direct. And there's something printed, i.e. this. Um, the final stage, and the most difficult case of all, um, is the case of those things where we only have the sound archive sources, plus a few scraps of non-musical notation to, doc to document these sources. Um, another one of these piano rolls is exactly that. Um, it is a, another Stavenhagen roll of this, again, very famous St. Francis walking on the waves. Um, now, St. Francis Walking on the Waves was one of the pieces that, that Stavenhagen played in one of his recitals when he accompanied Liszt to London in 1886. 
Um, Stavenhagen, during these concerts, played at least one other Liszt piece that was specifically revised by the composer for him. Um, that was the fantasy on Meyerbeer's Huguenot. Um, and it was printed in the London programs as new versions specially arranged by the composer for these concerts. What I'm arguing here is that the version of St. Francis Walking in the Waves that Stavenhagen plays in his 1905 piano role according to personal recollections of Liszt is another version um, that Liszt rearranged again for him, revised for him for the London concerts when he was playing the two Franciscan legends. Not indicated in the program this time, but concert programs in these days didn't always indicate this sort of thing anyway. Um, there is anyhow only a small window of opportunity for Liszt to have made an arrangement like this. Basically he had a few months before he died because he taught the, the St. Francis piece to several students towards the end of 1885 had made some minor modifications by that time, but not a thoroughgoing rewriting. By April 1886, he seems to somehow have made a thorough rewriting, which I think the only evidence of the Stavenhagen piano roll. The modifications he made before that are, are actually in manuscript, um, in a manuscript rather a printed edition belonging to Liszt pupil Bertolt Kellerman with editions by the composer dating from 1874. Again, not published by the new Liszt edition. You'll have to ask them why this is. But the, the, the um, variants of the ending in the Kellerman edition um, are played by other Liszt pupils such as Arthur Friedheim um, in their piano rolls and recordings. I mean, to give you just one example of what's in, in Kellerman, um, at the end of this piece, the, the, the conclusion in the published score, the only score published in Liszt's lifetime goes like this. OK, just, just E major. <coughs> what Friedheim plays, and until I find the Kellerman score, the Kellerman score is, is now in the Richard Wagner Museum in Bayreuth. And I only came across this by accident when I was visiting Bayreuth years ago, and the, it was on display. And there was a, a list score of St. Francis Walking in the Waves, a, a printed edition, and the ending had been scored out. It turned out to be Kellerman's copy. The ending was scored out, and what I'm about to play was written, and it had been signed, France List, 18, 1874. Um, so Kellerman's copy goes... <laughs> which is exactly what Friedheim plays in his piano roll, except that he, var he varies, instead of going he goes which is obviously a, a, probably something Liszt told him to do in 1884, ten, 10 years later. So we at least have a source of that. Odd oddly enough, to show how mixed up all this, the old Liszt edition, which was partly edited by Kellerman, in their critical notes pu published these variants, not in the main text, but they disappear by the new list edition because they don't meet their standards of, of source accuracy or whatever, even though they're actually in list hand. But I suspect the editors of the new list edition didn't know at the time that a copy still in list hand existed. So, so that's in Bayreuth. So what, what, do we, what do we have in this sort of final rewriting? As far as I can tell, the only textual evidence of this so the only musical evidence of this is in the piano roll. I suspect, however, that the variants are so extensive that just like with my joys, there must have been a manuscript at some time, which at the moment is lost. Um, I have further supportive evidence for this because in the old list edition, um, which was partly edited by Stavenhagen um, and by Kellerman and by other list pupils, Jose Viana de Motta or so, a sort of fight broke out among the editors as to what constituted a, an authentic text. Um, and also, there were certain, these were all pianists, remember, there were certain sort of feuds of personalities. Um, Buzzoni was one of the editors initially of the edition. He withdrew eventually. He hadn't been a Liszt pupil, but he was a big Liszt fan. He withdrew because he was fed up with Kellerman trying to tell him what, he do, he, what to do. And he thought Kellerman was an idiot, so he withdrew from this. It was pretty obvious that Stavenhagen and Kellerman didn't get on because Stavenhagen had been a very late pupil of Liszt. He only arrived in 1885. Kellerman had been a pupil of Liszt since 18. 
1972 and really resented the later pupils of Liszt, especially when they suddenly began to have better concert careers than he did. And that was really the unforgivable thing. So, so there was really no love lost be between these two. Um, and when Jose Viana da Mota came to edit for the old Liszt edition, St. Francis Walking on the Waves, um, he printed the score, the normal score, it was printed in Liszt's lifetime, but included a very, very odd paragraph in the critical commentary. Um, it's so odd it isn't even internally inconsistent, uh, internally consistent. He said, um, he said, several Liszt pupils possess many variants for this piece, he says, okay. Some of these variants are so extensive that, that they constitute effectively a different work. Okay, so they can't be meaning the Kellerman variants, which are, are sort of interesting and in improvements, but nothing to make it a different work. He said, he said, in the opinion of Professor Kellerman, the, the, these variants, i.e. the more extensive ones, and then this is where it gets very strange, I'm, I'm translating here from the German, it then changes tense from list students to the list student in a completely grammatically inconsistent way. According to Professor Kellerman, in his opinion, Th these variants result fr from the weakness of the, li the list student who was unable to play the piece as the master wrote it and was therefore required variants and cuts and, and, and other, other additions, okay? All very, very odd. And, and if you look at the original, which we don't have time, it's grammatically inconsistent as well. Um, if, we, if we go back to diaries written by Liszt bio biographer Lena Raman in 1885, we discover what the source of all this is. It's all very mysterious in the old Liszt edition. Anyway, they're not publishing the, this very, and notice that Fianna de Motta actually uses the word possesses. He says, you know, other Liszt people possess versions of this piece, suggesting there is a ma our manuscripts here. Um, if we go back to 1885, we discover that there was a sort of, shall we say, a fight between Kellerman and Stavenhagen in 1885 in Weimar, because Stavenhagen wanted to make um, some redispositions of the hands in St. Francis Walking in the Waves, which Kellerman objected to and, and went to Liszt to get his authority to say that, that Stavenhagen couldn't do this. And um, what Stavenhagen was obviously trying to do was he was the, the, when St. Francis walks in the waves he walks on the way here here are his waves okay <laughs> Um, Stavenhagen had wanted to double for extra strength. He'd wanted to double that intro down here. Exactly, that with both hands to get a, a bit more weight. The problem with that is that you, you, then the, the accompaniment, that the sort of waves get into the register of the tune. Yeah, so. Um, in other words, not distinct. And this is what List, List actually said, you know, it destroys the line, okay? So game set and match to Kellerman, apparently. However, it doesn't end there. It would seem that after this got List thinking, and he started making this final revision, um, of this piece effectively for Stavenhagen, doing it in a way that was, shall we say, better, um, and effectively as preparation for Stavenhagen's London concerts. Um, wh why do I think this? There's some internal evidence for a start. Some of the variants in the Stavenhagen version actually are based on the orchestral version that Liszt made, but remained unpublished until, in fact, about 10 years ago, uh, was available only in manuscript in Weimar, and it's next to impossible that, that Stavenhagen would have known this. Um, just to take one, one example, what is written in the piano score? Like that, what, what Stavenhagen plays? A which is exactly the string part in the orchestral version. In other words, we can build up a certain sort of you know, supportive evidence that this, these things likely, likely come from Liszt. Um, secondly, the Stavenhagen version otherwise corresponds to exactly the sort of comments that are in the old Liszt edition. You know, invasive changes, cuts, additions, alterations, etc., etc. There's only one thing it doesn't correspond to. It isn't actually any easier. 
In fact, in some respects, it's more difficult, although it probably suited Stavenhagen's technique. Um, to, just to take one example, the, the, the final climax um, in the published version goes like this. <laughs> which is the version you will probably know. Um, the version that Stavenhagen plays goes like this. Slight variant of the octaves, as you can hear. And now the octaves carry on on the bass. So not easier, at least it doesn't seem easier, easier to me. Um, it simply means that Stavin and I had better, le better left hand doctors effectively. And then, f then finally, immediately after that, the entire next two pages is completely, utterly rewritten. Um, and this is, I think, what Dan Mott and, and um, Kellerman meant about this is effectively a completely, completely new piece. Yeah. Um, I, I, if we carry on, on, on from this, um, what is published is. It's all completely cut. And then Stavenhagen starts again here. And instead of this, we have a very and it carries on like that. But the most interesting thing is the final climax in the published version, which goes like this. It's just a series of chords. Um, appears in this in this sort of way. In the, uh, none of that is roughly the same harmonic basis, but this is what you hear in Stavenhagen suddenly play. And this is again what made me sit up, going, "What on earth is he doing? This isn't just something he's improvised. This must come from Liszt." So instead of these chords, we 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 suddenly hear this. We're on the E flat chord now. <laughs> We're getting there. And we're now back to where we were in the public score with a little bit of a, an, an amplification. I think Liz at this point was thinking of the transition in the first scene of Das Rheingold, yeah? And that... Um, now, I've, trans I've transcribed the, the piano roll, and this is what you'll get. The, what I've written there is the printed version, and then Stavenhagen's variants um, up to there with the, the octaves and the bass, um, and then this sort of, you know, completely rewriting. There are other changes, um, but my basic point is that this is effectively... Um, and, and a new, ver a completely new version by Liszt. I suspect it's the version that, that Bertolt Kellerman and, and Jose Viana da Mota got very hot under the collar about um, and didn't want to print in the old Liszt edition, but felt they had to acknowledge that it existed. Notice in the preface to the old Liszt edition, they don't say this doesn't come from Liszt. Um, they simply say, well, he only wrote it because this guy couldn't play the original, which is obviously not true. Um, and the other thing is, Stavenhagen had a very good concert career. In fact, in, um, he, his actual tone production was described by many um, reviewers, especially in America, as being the closest to the elderly list. 
Um, so I think we're dealing here with a sort of bit of pianistic jealousy. Nevertheless, the, the old list edition at least acknowledged the existence of this. Um, the, the new list edition seems to be totally unaware of even of the issue, if you like. It's, it's just co completely silent about this. So finally, what is my general point here? Um, that there are many other examples I would give you, including Toten Tanz um, for piano and orchestra, which I played last year in the list bicentenary in a, in a completely different version from the one normally played and printed, again coming from list pupils and obviously revised by him um, in 1885. Um, what's the general point here? The general point here is that the normal very strict rules of text transmission that are being used for music like this and not just lists simply don't work. Um, it, we miss out masses of material. We also ironically miss out the fasum lets our hand. You know, what the urtext is supposed to want to get at the final version authorized by the composer are in fact these things, um, not actually the final textually authentic version. Um, so even by its own aims, these sorts of procedures are not working. Um, if we want to do this properly, we can't, re it's very difficult to do this in print. I mean, uh, th these are relatively simple examples. There are examples that would take, I could, I could print you five, six, seven different variant versions. The only way to do this is probably some sort of web-based hypertext where a performer can actually see layers of di variant versions with the various sources and arguments for the justification for them next to each other. In other words, the sort of hypertext that we're sort of getting there with Chopin. J John Rinks published a sort of catalog on the internet of Chopin complete editions. Um, which begins to do that with the published version of Chopin. The only trouble with Liszt is it would be massively larger. Liszt lived, you know, 35 years longer than Chopin, wrote far more, um, had far greater mania for variants, but at least we now have the technical means to do it. Um, even if we were not to wish to do that, we could still effectively produce new editions of a lot of, in fact, Liszt's most fr frequently played pieces that, in fact, enshrine this sort of rather dubious concept of the composer's last thoughts as far um, as, as they can be ascertained. I'm not suggesting the latter because I think the whole idea of last thoughts is really you know, not applicable in this case anyway. But my point is, this, this is just a general introduction. This is really the, the state of play. This is what I think should be happening. This is how I think we can argue these things. And finally, we need to look at piano rolls and early recordings for evidence not just of how people played, but evidence of what they played. Thank you very much.